Uh, hi, uh, this is John from Forest London and uh, today we're going to be looking at how to identify uh, three or four late season edible mushrooms. Uh, the first thing to say is if you're going to be doing this and you're going to go, you're going to hunt for wild mushrooms, uh, obviously you need to know what you're looking for and <clears throat> you need to really have some experience of what you're doing or at least go with somebody who's got some experience. Uh, so it's not something to be trifled with. There's a lot of uh, dangerous, uh, poisonous mushrooms out there that could be confused with some of the ones that we're going to look at. The ones that we're going to look at, though, are uh, easy to identify and have some very um, obvious key features that I'm going to show you about. Um, <clears throat> so what I would say is if you're going to go out and you're going to pick wild mushrooms, um, bring them back like this. Bring them back with the base on and with uh, some foliage, some leaves and things like that. The last thing that you want to do is to be uh, bringing something back, trying to identify it, looking in your book and then reading and it's got a bulbous base to it. Oh, you haven't got the bulbous base, you've chopped it off. Or it was growing under oak and you don't know because you haven't really looked at the foliage. So bring back with you as much information as you possibly can. Um, so this is the first one that we're going to look at. This is, um, this is a trooping funnel cap and it's a lovely uh, chunky mushroom, it's a good size, it's a good edible mushroom, it's got a good sweet smell to it, a mushroomy smell but also quite a, quite a sweet aroma as well. Now you'll find this growing in uh, woodland edges and on the uh, perhaps the edge of country lanes and things like that. It's not something you're going to find in big rings really in the middle of a woodland. It's more kind of grows on the periphery, the edges and the, and the borders. <clears throat> What's good about this is um, when you find this, this mushroom, the trooping funnel cap, you'll find a troop of them. You'll find a big group of them. Um, sometimes you only find three or four, but very often you could sort of find 15 or 20 of them. Um, so it's got some some key ID features to help us work out uh, the difference between this and uh, potentially dangerous mushrooms. Now in this family, the funnels, uh, and, and the Latin name is, is Clitocybe. This is in fact Clitocybe geotropa. Um, so in, in that group, Clitocybe, the funnels, <coughs> there are quite a few poisonous and some deadly mushrooms. But in order to um, keep those well away from the spectrum of what you might be picking. Uh, if you avoid picking any funnel shaped mushrooms that are smaller than about uh, 8 to 10 centimetres across, that would completely eliminate um, the three or four extremely dangerous ones that are uh, maybe 2 to 4 centimetres across. Now, this actually, I've picked these the size of a dinner plate. So perhaps this kind of size across, I had to pull over quite dangerously on a dual carriageway and jump out to pick them because I couldn't, couldn't help myself. Um, we've got some really good ID features here. The, the stem and the gills and the cap are generally what's called concolorous, which means that they're basically the same colour. Now, I hope you can see that actually, as this has dried out a little bit, because I picked this yesterday, the stem <coughs> is, uh, is much darker than the gills and the cap somewhere in between. But when I picked them, pretty much I would describe this, this and this all as a uh, buff kind of colour. Um, there are various other funnels and a couple of smaller ones that have the cap and the gills and the stem all the same colour, but nothing this size. When you um, find a troop of these, you might get ones <coughs> up to these kind of dimensions, perhaps even bigger. So if you kind of work backwards and you make sure that there's definitely a big one in the group, that will help you to know that the rest are going to potentially get that size. So you're looking for stem the same colour, gills the same colour, cap the same colour, and the gills on the funnels are what's called decurrent, so they run down the stem. If this was a field mushroom, the, uh, the gills would run along and then they just turn up before they reach the stem, they don't join it. With this, it's the polar opposite, they run down the stem and join it. <coughs> so that's a really good ID feature. Then there's one final 
two final ID features, um, one of which is smell. Now, for me, this, um, this has got a sweet mushroomy smell, but uh, you can only really use that as an ID feature once you've become familiar with it. Smells are so different for everybody. For me, this smells a little bit like some sweets we used to get when we were kids called Pez that come in little bricks in a cool little dispenser. But that's a, no information, you know, it's useless information to everybody else unless you're aware of what that smells like. Um, so you can only use that as an ID feature once you're actually sure. The best ID feature for this uh, mushroom for me is something that for some reason doesn't appear in books, which is that it's got this little dimple here. A lot of the mushrooms when they're, um, when they're younger and they're shaped like this, on the top they have a little bump and that's called an umbro and they're referred to as being umbronate and they've got this little dimple and then what happens is as they flatten out, some of them tend to lose it, some of them keep it, some of them will be flat with this little dimple. But, to the best of my knowledge, none of them become a funnel and still retain this little dimple, this little nipple. It's quite, it's quite distinct and it's present in varying degrees on all of these ones at the same time. So that's a good edible mushroom. You can cut the stems off. The stems are a bit tougher, so you cook those separately because uh, they need more cooking, but you could just slice and fry um, uh, the caps on these. And you're going to find that, uh, <clears throat> I would say, generally on the edge of deciduous woodland, so mixed woodland, um, oaks and, uh, and beech and birch, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> so long as you stick with uh, the size and you don't go uh, for anything smaller in the funnels, uh, then you're on relatively safe ground. There's uh, another uh, similar funnel called a clouded agaric or a grey funnel that grows to similar sizes, grows in a similar way, uh, but it definitely isn't this buff kind of colour. It's a grey cap and it has palish gills. Um, so that's our, that's our first one. And here's our second mushroom. Same thing, what I've done basically is I've, uh, I've kept a, a little bit of the base on but we don't really need that so we can just cut through that. This is uh, Hydnum repandum, more commonly known as hedgehog fungus or hedgehog mushroom, sometimes called the wood urchin and not this one because it's a bit bigger but some of the smaller ones grow with a kind of dimple in them and so they call it pied de mouton. So the sheep's foot or mutton's foot. That's a very easy mushroom to identify and you find this growing in pine and you find it's growing in deciduous woodland and it's a late fruiting mushroom so you know maybe mid-October depending on the weather. Could be last year I was picking this right the way through into late January maybe early February and uh, what's really distinct about it is um, it has these spines on the bottom. So the one that we looked at earlier has got decurrent gills going down the stem. This doesn't have um, uh, gills at all. It has these hedgehoggy type spines. Um, there's only half a dozen uh, that you'll find that have got this arrangement and there's uh, nothing in, in that group that we've got in the UK that's going to do you any harm. Um, when you find these, you'll find them kind of nestling in the leaf litter and uh, you look along and find they're growing huge banana shaped arcs in the forest floor. So once you find one you can end up finding loads which is brilliant and it's a nice uh, uh, quite meaty mushroom. Um, if they're big and they're a bit wet you put them in the fridge for a couple of days and that helps them to really dry out so you can fry them and they keep in the fridge for maybe a couple of weeks which is brilliant and they don't reduce a lot when you cook them. Uh, what other ID features have we got here? Uh, this kind of um, uh, pinky, orangey colour, peachy kind of colour. Um, I mean it varies a little bit from, <coughs> from one to another as you can see. Um, but generally these spines are the, are the ID. Um, and, and sometimes you'll find one and you won't see others. You have to kind of like look where you think they might be and brush away the leaf litter and you can come across a lot of them. It's really easy to pick a basket of these quite quickly and it's a very, very, very common uh, late season mushroom and very tasty as well. So this is a hedgehog mushroom or hydnum repandum. Um, 
What else have we got here? I'm just going to have a sip of my tea. So these are winter chanterelle. The Latin name for these is uh, Cantharellus tubiformis, or something very similar to that. Uh, they changed the name a little while ago. They have an even longer name. Basically, winter chanterelle, sometimes called grey chanterelle, or sometimes called yellow leg, and related to the, the classic chanterelle. Um, what happens is you're walking in um, woodland late in the season, sort of November time, and you're looking for these and you can't find any. And then you find one. And then you bend down and you look around and you realise you're completely surrounded, that there's 10,000 of them, that you've been walking through them. And basically what they do is hide in plain sight. If you look at this, the top of this, especially a sort of mixed deciduous woodland, basically they just look like little leaves and they'll be hiding in amongst the foliage. <coughs> um, it's a really good, really common, uh, really prolific uh, winter mushroom and I've picked these even in the snow, so they're frost resistant as well. Um, identification features, they have a uh, yellow or grey yellow stem, sometimes it'd be a lot more pronounced than this and you can find them from this sort of size up to kind of maybe sort of 10 centimetres high. They have grey coloured gills that are more like ridges than actual gills and they're also decurrent like the funnel that we looked at they run slightly down let's go the other way around they run slightly down the stem they join it and run down it a little bit in the younger ones they are often quite yellow so often the cap um, the, the gills and the stem are the same colour but when you find them you'll always find a big patch and you'll find ones of different sizes <clears throat> and that's another thing about identifying mushrooms, you don't ever identify anything from one specimen, you want numerous specimens, you want some juvenile ones, you want some uh, nice sort of medium sized ones and you want some mature ones, often the ones that are really mature and will have gone over uh, and might not be good to eat will have a lot more information in the gills, um, if you think of what a button mushroom looks like, it's got a little pink uh, gills to it and then when you get a big portobello mushroom it's got dark almost black gills and that's because the spores have all started to come out and you've got a lot more information so you can tell looking at the older one what colour the spores are but you can't tell looking at the younger one so there's always uh, different bits of information to be gleaned so with this like I say you've got uh, a yellow stem and then you've got uh, grey grey yellow uh, ridges gills running running down the stem and then you have a very brown wavy cap and generally speaking uh, you've got this brown wavy cap and you've actually got a hole that goes right the way down the middle of it making it like a little trumpet or a little tube and um, when I pick these what I tend to do is I don't bother with a knife I just pull that pull that bit off you can you can find so many of them you can fill a basket they reduce a lot when you cook them when you cook them you lob them in a pan without um, any, any oil at all and heat them for a minute or so and a lot of water will come off them then you can take that water off and keep it then you can put oil in the pan and fry the mushrooms then you could use that oil that um, water to make a nice sauce to go with them as well and that's really good so um, find these in mixed woodland and you find these in pine as well uh, so like I say, hiding in plain sight is, is an expression made to describe these. Once you know what you're looking for and you find one, you can find loads. You could easily be picking these uh, Christmas Day, uh, like I say, frost tolerant and, and a good, uh, good tasty mushroom. So <clears throat> that's those. There's one more. What I was going to do was I was going to uh, make this about four uh, late late fruiting, late season tasty mushrooms. The other one I wanted to show you was a wood bluet. And a wood bluet is a kind of bright purpley blue colour and it's got some really distinct ID features. But it only generally comes out when uh, really you start to get the first frost 
and um, so I was in the woods yesterday and the only examples of it that I could find really weren't uh, very good uh, to help with identification they were they were a little bit sort of collapsing and they and they didn't look terrific um, but that would be my if you like my fourth of a group of perfect uh, late season mushrooms so if you look into that find out what a wood blue it looks like and then you'd have hedgehog mushrooms in your basket you'd have trooping funnel caps in your basket you'd have winter chanterelle in your basket and you'd have wood bluets in your basket you have a really amazing selection of colors and flavors and textures um, what we're going to look at instead is what i did find plenty of which is this and this is a, a, a bay belit so um B-A-Y, and Belitus is the, the, the name of the genus, it's the name of the whole group that these come in, and that includes uh, some poisonous mushrooms and some edible mushrooms. It includes, most famously, the Puccini mushroom. In Italy, the Puccini. In France, they call it the Sep. The old English name for it would be the Penny Bun, and the, the Latin name for that is Belitus edulis. Anyway, uh, that's the most popular of this group. It's a much chunkier mushroom than this. Um, the thing about a babelite is often you'll find a lot of them and they won't be riddled with maggots and it's quite a good tasty mushroom and it's easy to identify. So unlike the others that we've looked at with gills or with uh, little spines hanging down in, in the case of the, the hedgehog mushroom or kind of ridges more than gills in, in the case of the winter chanterelle, this doesn't have gills at all. What it's got is uh, what I describe as pores or tubes. So basically it's got what looks like a sponge running all the way through here. And when, when this mushroom drops its spores, it drops its spores out of these tubes. Now, <clears throat> so no gills, it has no ring, unlike uh, say a field mushroom or some of the other mushrooms, no stem ring or anything like that. And it has quite a thin, woody looking stem as well. Let me look at it slightly different example. You could find it a quite a bit chunkier than this as well. But the ID feature for this that is uh, perhaps the most specific is if you turn it over and if you press into these tubes, this one's already done it quite a lot, so we'll hope that this works for the sake of the film. There we go. So pressing into those tubes and what the tubes that were previously a kind of yellow colour, that's a bit more evident on there, bruise quite a distinct uh, blue colour. Now that's a really easy way to identify this. Within this whole group, if you avoid any that have red or strong orange pores here, or any that bruise an intensely strong blue when you cut them through the cap, um, cut them through the stem, then that will put you onto safe ground. Uh, with with the babelite, it may bruise a, a tiny bit, uh, oxidise a tiny bit blue through through the stem, but generally speaking, as you can see, nothing. There's no severe reaction. Some of the ones to avoid, you cut them and they just go. Phoomph, blue in front of you. So this, this is a little bit old um, or a little bit wet from when I picked it but you can see it's bruised blue into there. So it's got a woody stem, no gills except it's got yellow tubes, and bruised blue when you push into them and a really kind of nice nutty brown cap. When you find them when they're wet they're very slimy and shiny on top um, and you could confuse it with another one of this family that has a slimy top but that also has a ring on the stem. Um, that's an edible mushroom too but you just want to get the identification right. So that would be the Babel Eat. <clears throat> that would be the fourth of our ones that we've got to look at. Um, what I'd also say is if you're going to go mushroom hunting ideally go with somebody who knows their stuff because it, it can be a risky business. With the four mushrooms that we've looked at here, I would go out, I would pick them, I would bring them back, I would cross-reference my identification in two or three books. If I was 100% sure, and more than 100% sure, I would say, if I had the assurance of somebody who did know what they're doing, then I might contemplate eating them. Uh, even if I were to do that, what I would probably do is a bit of a tolerance test anyway. 
Uh, when we eat new foods, a lot of wild foods, it's not that they're necessarily poisonous, it's that they may not agree with us. We're all wired in different ways. So I might take, um, I might take this and I might, that might be my first portion. I fry that and eat it and if the following morning I felt fine I might go for sort of twice that and if I still felt fine at the end of the day then I'd probably eat more of it. But that's me talking about what I would do with a mushroom that I'm 100% sure is edible. Eating something or trying a bit of something or, or casual nibbling which I come across a lot of people doing is not part of the ID process. It's bloody stupid and bloody dangerous and it's not something you do unless you are absolutely certain that you know what you've got and that it's safe. One other thing I'd say is um, if you look at an example of say seaweed, if you want good seaweed you'd go to a beach where you knew the water quality was good. So if you want to pick mushrooms that are not going to absorb lots of toxicity, which they are excellent at doing, they're superb at absorbing toxicity. Um, if you want mushrooms that are going to be clean and going to be, going to be healthy, then get out of the city, don't pick them in an urban environment. There's too much pollution, historical pollution, sort of general toxicity. I see people picking uh, mushrooms in Victorian graveyards and you think about what you might find in a Victorian graveyard apart from bodies and, and the like, which is not really a problem. You're going to find lots of arsenic and lead and mercury and all sorts of other horrible chemicals which the mushrooms will absorb fantastically. The mushroom mycelium that's the, the organism under the ground will absorb that <coughs> and uh, be breaking it down and what part of the way that it expels a lot of the toxicity that it absorbs is it fruits it. So <coughs> um, yeah, get out, get out of the city, get, get into a, a, a nice wooded area. Um, I think that's, that's everything. I uh, hope that's useful. Um, if you uh, <coughs> have any questions and you want to uh, send them to me at uh, john at foragelondon.co.uk, then please do. If you want me to identify a mushroom for you, I probably won't. I don't do photo ID. And generally speaking, people send me, uh, <coughs> they send me a photograph of the top of a mushroom and they say, can you tell me what this is? and I send back a photograph of the top of somebody's head and say, no, can you tell me who this is? Because uh, it's very difficult to do without uh, a lot of the key information that we've looked at today. So I hope that's useful for you and um, thanks for watching.